this will work out. We have George Odongo, a member of the East African Legislative Assembly, and Jen Nalunga, country director of the Satini, Uganda. This is on the spot. Allow me, first of all, to refer to you by your first names. Is that okay? Yeah, that's that's fine. Jane Patrick. and George, thank you so much for thank having you, honored our invitation. Um, a warm welcome to both of you. Thank, thank you. you. You are on the spot tonight, and we want to listen uh, from you because of your particular expertise and skills and what you know about our country and the region in which we live. Congo has just been, you know, uh, admitted into the East African community which means the East African community now from the Atlantic Ocean in the West to the Indian Ocean, that great expanse has come into one community. But I'm going to start with you, George, because you represent us at the East African Legislative Assembly in Arusha. I know the leaders could have gathered, uh, you know, had a meeting and accepted this. But if you go to Kenya, somewhere in Yahururu, or go to South Sudan, somewhere in Kajokeji, or go to Democratic Republic of Congo, somewhere in Lubumbashi or in Kibati, go to Tanzania, somewhere in Bagamoyo, go to Rwanda, somewhere in Ruhenjeri, or come here to Uganda, somewhere in Chawente. Do people care? Do they even know? Patrick, <clears throat> the way um, our integration is being, um, you know, there are two approaches to integration. Mm -hmm. There is the, uh, what you would call the neo-functionalist. That's the one that is largely broad-based. But there is also the, the supra, um, supra-naturalist which really um, emphasizes more on institutions, governments. So th the way this integration is being um, constructed, it's leadership-led. <coughs> That's the model that we are following, where, you know, governments, it's an intergovernmental cooperation. So it's a discussion that takes place between governments. And <coughs> the assumption here is that governments are acting in the best interest of, of the, the population. People. So once that decision has been taken, then the people are brought on board. So this, that's why if you went to Chawente, probably they do not know that we have Democratic Republic of Congo joining the East African community. But with time, they will then be brought on because board. Because this East African project, Mr. Honorable George Dong, is not a new thing. Ever since it was revived, through the efforts of President Mwai Kibaki, Benjamin Mukapa, and the Awari Museveni around the late of 1999 or 2000, thereabout. I mean, it's more than 20 years since this thing was resuscitated. The people in our different villages in East Africa by now should actually be understanding where we stand. For it only to be, you know, a preserve of the elite of people who put on good suits, designer suits like you, and sit in marble corridors of Arusha, it's your own thing. No. Um, le, you know, you know, this ES is not the first regional body. Even the, 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 the European Union, it has taken a lot of time. The building blocks to our integration keep on increasing. It's, it has incremental value. Now, we need to get the first things first <coughs> done. We need to make sure that we create the institutions we need to ensure that we have the legal frameworks in place to facilitate, you know, the cooperation between these different partner it's states. Could you and bring then in the example of the European Union? Just yes. a year or two ago, the British were exiting this project. And in fact, for more than 50 years, that they have even failed to have a political federation. But you know, if, if you look at the European Union very closely, the, 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 the British have always been the the, the unique, if you want to call it so. They are always exploring the, 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 op the other, what do you call the opt-out clauses within the frameworks that exist. For example, European Union, though it was part of the um, 
signed the Maastricht Agreement did not, uh, um, did not, did not sign the, 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 the agreement to join the Schengen countries. It was not. Europe, uh, Britain did not join the Eurozone in spite of the fact that it was part of the European Union. Those are exceptions. <coughs> but broadly speaking, the European Union is working. And Britain is enjoying the benefits of having been part of the European Union. Let me, okay, well, uh, you know, I started with hounding you, which <laughs> maybe is not a good thing. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, so General you Lumba, your skills are into <laughs> negotiations. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Certini, you've done a good job. Explain to the people viewing or listening to you tonight, what benefits does Congo bring on the table? Why should we, Uganda, be associating with the Congo with its toxic politics on the day when Congo was admitted is the same day when war erupted in the DRC. And we are just joining a, a group of people with all respect that the eastern part of their country that is bigger than Uganda have never been able to manage themselves. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Patrick. And good evening, viewers. So you are, you are going to hound me uh, from <laughs> <laughs> after George. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's really interesting uh, the reasons why the East African community is expanding to DRC. Uh, because DRC is a, a problem child, you know. It's uh, like you are saying, maybe it's uh, toxic, really. Um, but uh, in Seattle, we <coughs> believe in continental unity. We believe that we need to work together as a region, as a continent, if we are to survive within the very cutthroat globalization. Mm. We need to be together. And this begs the question then, what kind of regional integration agenda should we be looking at? And for me, I believe really we need to, we should have balanced mm, the opportunities and the risks of bringing DRC on board. And I think we should have learned uh, lessons uh, from South Sudan. You know, how did we fare with South Sudan? But I think we also need to remember that DRC is part of COMESA. We are members of COMESA. Um, we have a tripartite, ESC, COMESA, and SADAC. Mm -hmm. And maybe we would have explored those other avenues of trading with DRC. And I want to agree with um, uh, Honorable George that um, the regional integration agenda has become a political agenda. Yet when you read the treaty, the ES treaty, it's clear. It should be people-centered, private sector driven. We have a question mark there. But you don't see the private sector even within the negotiations for the DRC to join the ESC. So, so for me, I think we need to democratize mm, uh, the way the regional integration project is being run and who is coming on board so that we can be able to go beyond the politics to look at real actual issue. And we need to see it as a country, as a region, to ask what are those benefits you want to uh, to achieve by DRC joining ESC. Can't we get it in, in any other way? Because you see that, that another risk DRC uh, joining ESC is because of this budget bow of regional integration. Uh, DRC is a member of COMESA, now a mem member of ESC, a member of SADAC, member of ECAS. ECAS Semaka is the Central African uh, REC, Regional Integration Grouping. You know, already the subscription is going to be a problem. But also the royalty. You are in SADAC, you are in ECAS, you are, you know, the, where is the royalty? But then also, if we are to use our regional integration um, uh, as blocks for the continental free trade area, then the, the regs should be very strong. Uh, if you can but hold on there, Jen, mm. how does a country belong 
to two or three different trading blocks. And sometimes those trade blocks have their own objectives and agenda. Exactly. Different. Because if SADC and the ESC, you know, I can imagine ESC ultimate goal is a political federation. Huh. How do you subscribe to those uh, uh, And those are all the challenges which we, we, we are going to face with DRC being a member of the ESC. Even ECHAS, SEMAC, it has its own agenda. But also the mere fact that if you are a member, then you should be a member. You should put your whole into developing that region. But you can't be with, with one hand here, another hand there, another leg there, and another leg there. And you expect to, uh, to make a difference or to be uh, an active member of those regional blocks. Honorable Judge Dong, uh, as a member of the East African Legislative Assembly, we have had a problem, Kampala and Kigali, for almost three years. <coughs> If this, the East African community of a summit of presidents cannot call the leaders to order, because one of the reasons why we're coming together is about trade, but for three years, Kigali and Kampala are not even working together. For three years, the East African community can only stand by and watch. What is it for? Patrick. <coughs> um, there is a big picture. And I think when, when, when you listen to the leadership of um, the East African community, particularly at the summit level, they articulate the bigger picture issues. And, and you can tell clearly that, you know, there are um, economic issues and there are also political issues. Um, sometimes I look at it more like it's transactional, that, you know, there, is, there has got to be a transactional relationship for us to, to relate. Now, in the case of Uganda and, um, and, 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 um, and Rwanda, the, 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 the ESC, the framers of our treaty, did not envisage a situation where, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole thinking was predicated upon goodwill, political goodwill. The assumption was that there is goodwill between uh, the heads of summit, I mean, heads of state, so that if there is a problem between uh, myself and, and, and Kamara, then Jen would, would intervene. Yeah, but you see, if now, we have a regional block, <coughs> and then we are acting in a bilateral manner, yeah. uh, us and South Sudan, we and Kenya with our sugar and, uh, and fish exports and milk exports, instead of the Arusha sitting and handling our issues, President Yehudi Museven has to sit with President Uhuru Kenyatta to deal with matters of trade where we are in the common market. We expect the East African community to be having a mechanism that can arbitrate. We cannot be in a block and handle issues at a bilateral level. I agree with you, um, uh, um, Patrick. The, the, as I told you that the... Um, over the last 20 years, there have been so many learning points as we experience our integration. We do not have enough tools within our toolbox to resolve, mm -hmm. say, you know, conflicts between partner states, mm -hmm. particularly where heads of state are involved. We also do not have mechanisms for effective enforcement of compliance. Remember that the East African community is not an independent you know, they still, uh, mm. so the sovereignty of partner states is still preserved. Now, because of sovereignty of partner states, you cannot impose on a partner state the will of the community. So, so where so is this entity? That's, why, that's what I was saying. That's where is, it, uh, this, where is this entity? Supranational interest. That's what I'm saying, that the ESC is work in progress. And, 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 I, and I think that when we transition, into a political confederation. This, this is the kind of conversation that is going, is, is going on right now. To see that where, what are the mechanisms for enforcement of compliance? Because at the moment, how the, the, the institution is structured, the different institutions are structured and the organs of the community are structured, there is no mechanism of compliance. Even where we have, um, even where we have um, within the treaty a provision for say if a partner state is defaulting if a partner then there is a provision for that partner state to be uh, indicted 
that also requires consensus, broad consensus. So the principle of consensus also undermines the speed at which decisions are being made. But this, is, this has a historical background to it, Patrick. The history of our EAC is such that the, national, the, the, the partner states during the first uh, 1967, uh, you will find that the partner states were very, um, had interests. So national politics, national interests were so strong. And when we were coming back to this current, when we were reviving the ESC, <coughs> the framers of this new dispensation were cautious of, about that and still maintained the supremacy of national, uh, of, of partner states. Now, that, that has been, um, that has, has caused a problem because we do not have a mechanism of resolving this, these issues. The conversations recently were, uh, were around, you know, the, the, the panel of experts is now looking at how do we enforce compliance in an environment where partner states are sovereign. Now, that discussion is ongoing right now. Okay. Uh, Jen, you're more interested in matters of trade and negotiation. I can see uh, people are celebrating. Our population has increased by 50% of the East African community now that J Congo has joined us almost 300 million people from the Atlantic Sea to the Indian, to the Indian Ocean. And, and so that's a big common market, I suppose. But it's a common market of people who are poor. In other words, it's common poverty. What is <laughs> it? Is. Yeah, yeah. What is our purchasing power? What, uh, even, uh, even if you, you, you had goods and you're sending them to, to Congo or wherever it is, at the end of the day, you're going to produce goods for the poor people. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really important to, uh, to be clear why we are, we are into the regional integration project. And I think for me, we are going offline, you know, uh, because uh, regional integration should be about the people, raising the standard of living of the people, ensuring that we pool as a region our resources so that we can be able to industrialize, produce more, create jobs, uh, promote uh, regional value chains. You know, looking at that higher, higher level. And for me, I, I think it would also reduce on the competition. You talked about the sugar. We are, we are producing sugar, you know. We want to sell sugar to Kenya, Kenya, mommy, as they have their sugar. Then there is a problem. But if we can be able to look at regional value chains, the other is coming on board, mm -hmm. and we can be able to look at what resources do they have, what regional value chains can we develop, get people out of poverty. But now we are looking at the market, you know. It's like we are vouchers, all of us, which market we are going to sell this. But the people are poor, the other sees a contradiction. It's the richest, richest country, but with the poorest people. In fact, I was reading somewhere that the minerals which are not yet uh, 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 exploited total up the value around 24 trillion dollars just to the could minerals be the richest there. country in the world exactly mm. but it's the with the poorest people you know in, in security and all that for me what i think is uh, we need to go back on the drawing board look at why are we coming together as a region we are we are we are reducing regional integration into markets what are we getting? One, Kenya. Kenya is getting KCB, equity, Brookside, Uganda. What are, we, what are we? It's like grabbing. What are we grabbing there? And I think we need to look at alternatives have to we, regional integration. George, have we really sorted our leadership and governance issues? Running, for example, Uganda like a business, like Uganda Incorporated, because that would mean something. When you look at Kenya, they seem to have taken a step in sorting their leadership issues, their politics. Um, in August, they'll, maybe they will be able to have a smooth uh, <coughs> you know, a change of power and somebody else will come in. But other countries, you know, there's a lot of work to do. In South Sudan, just three, four days ago, Riyad Machar was saying he had been surrounded by government forces 
the government of national unity is so shaky and so wobbly. In Congo, war is constant. We have the United Nations peacekeeping force, the biggest peacekeeping force in the world, taking the biggest uh, part of the, of, of the budget for 20 years. 20 years. They have failed even solve the issues of Congo. In Uganda, our political question has never been followed, has not been sorted. We've never had any, not, not even once, smooth transition of power. If we have not been able to solve our politics, our leadership, even when we come together, we are coming together in a region that is, you know, an island of chaos. Patrick, governance is work in progress. Um, fixing our governance issues. If we are to wait that until we fix our governance issues, for example, Congo has been in, in such a, a situation since the 1960s up, up to now. When do you think that Congo is going to, to fix its problems uh, so that it can, you know, become part of, you know, the, the environment that you're trying to, to suggest here? What the ESC proposes is that we can fix our governance issues while working together on matters of economics, on the economy. So the, 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 the <coughs> economic cooperation goes with political cooperation mm -hmm. and social integration. So there are three benefits that are anticipated under our integration agenda. There is the political, there is economic, and then there is social. All of them go hand in hand. The thinking is that if we drive if we drive trade and therefore enhance the prosperity of the people, then people will selfishly guard, you know, they will selfishly guard, uh, protect their interests. And therefore that will motivate, that will motivate um, um, our, 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 motivate, uh, motivate our different partner states, you know, to build the institutions that guarantee political and economic stability. So. It's, it's, a, it's, not, it's not that we are going to wait until we fix the economic issues or we fix the political issues. They are all going to be, to be moving together as work in progress. Now, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. I, I am one person who believes that <coughs> had we not been in this ESC integration, the three years the, of our, you know, the standoff between Uganda and, 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 and Rwanda could have probably produced quite different results. You know, there's the power of restraint that comes with being together, at least in terms of our, 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 our cooperation, you know. Now, if we had left it to our own devices, if each partner state was left to its devices, without this SOPRA, this organization called the regional, um, the ESC, Maybe the levels of hostility between us and Rwanda would have escalated to a level where probably would be speaking a different language now. So just the fact that we, we are bound together by a certain ideal is restrained good enough to allow for those problems, for the healing, and so on and so forth. So governance question is very, very important. I always say that governance is the software that drives all these other, you know, you uh, know uh, our you integration agenda. But it is not something that you are going to say you are going to fix it today. You will not. But as, a, as an MP in our East African uh, Parliament, East African Assembly, yes. you know the issue concerning Ugandan traders who supplied goods to South Sudan, and because there's some chaos in South Sudan, some of them actually had supplied government and it's taken years you know some of them have taken loans sold their houses to get money and get into business and start supplying south sudan and chaos erupts and south sudan has no uh, some of them have never been paid others have lost everything they had and yet they, we belong to this thing called the east african community are you aware about that i am aware of it but you know by the time they were erupted in south in south sudan we south sudan was 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 already part of esc South Sudan was already yeah. part of part of part of. So part if, of if it could not solve so the problems of the Ugandan business people who have lost colossal sums of money in Juba, and for years others have gone into bankruptcy, what is it helping us? No, listen. Mm -hmm. We the the the. 
to resolve or to solve the problem of, of, of our traders first requires that South Sudan itself should have capacity to solve them. South Sudan is still grappling internally. And as far as we are concerned, as far as ESC is concerned, we, you do not interfere with the internal politics of a partner state. Because we are still sovereign states. So there is no way the East African community can go and try to impose, you know, uh, it's, it's um, try to impose a solution to the South Sudanese. The South Sudanese can be facilitated to resolve that matter. So as long as the South Sudanese haven't resolved, you know, their leadership, their governance question, it's very difficult for us to say now, oh, you know, let's, let's, let's get our, 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 our. President, that's why President Museveni came in and said, we are going to work very closely with the government of South Sudan. Uh, government of Uganda will compensate the traders, and then we'll talk to the government of South Sudan. Because at the <coughs> moment, there is a, 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 a serious problem going on in South Sudan that undermines their capacity to, 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 to compensate the traders in Uganda. So, you know, we don't interfere. We do not. Okay. It's a principle of the community that you don't interfere in the internal matters, okay. particularly okay. governance matters of the Jane, traders. before we take a break, I want you an explanation from you on this very issue. On the same day that DRC is admitted into the East African community, is the same day the DRC is choosing a partner state for having sent soldiers across the border to, you know, incursions into their country. Mm. On the day when the leaders are on a virtual meeting mm. admitting Felix Eskedi's country, mm. is the day Felix Eskedi's country is pointing at a choosing finger mm. of Kigali. Mm. I mean, how is, it that, how is that going to work? Is the day when we have an influx of refugees through Bunagana and Tukisoro mm. in mm. tens of thousands? Mm. Yeah, Patrick, the issues you are raising um, have been raised by all the East Africans. What's happening, you know? Um, and also, I was saying when we started this conversation uh, uh, about learning lessons um, from South Sudan. So, so how do you then encourage our private sector to go and invest in, in DRC, you know, with that very fluid, volatile situation, you know? So, so maybe, maybe we need to reassess, uh, we need to look at, maybe we still have time, because we need to work out a roadmap up to September, Maybe these are issues which we need to be discussed. But I think what's also important is for our private sector to know what they are going into, you know, so that we don't repeat what happened in, uh, in South Sudan. You know, some of our private sector can be quick, you know. Somebody says, oh, your money is there. You go borrow, go and invest. You, you, get, a, you, know, you, you, you get a killing. But I think our private sector should be educated. They need to know the opportunities, but also to know the risks, and so that they can be able to weigh those risks. Okay. But for me, I really think that for DRC, uh, maybe um, it was really quick to admit it in the ESC, because we do really have other ways where we, are tr where we can be able to trade with DRC and also help them to be able to stabilize the situation. We have been in DRC, you know, uh, assisting them to, uh, to address the ADF issue. They haven't been part of the ESC, you know. So, so these are issues which we need to, uh, to, to discuss. And maybe Patrick, lastly, is the issue of democratizing these conversations and debate. Mm. As we said, regional integration agenda is about the people. It has to be people-centered. Okay. About the people, about the private sector. Jane and George, uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, let's look deeper into the benefits <coughs> that this uh, trade bloc brings to the people of this East African community that has just expanded almost by 50%. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. You're watching <laughs> On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara and my guests tonight are Jen Nalunga from Siatini and Honorable Jojo Dong, who is a member of the East African Legislative Assembly and we're discussing the DRC joining the East African community. Okay, so now, uh, the benefits, we have told us the benefits are immense. And uh, Uganda is now, has been building roads, by the way, into the DRC uh, for economic benefit. I I'm told we get quite a, a lot of money from the DRC by trading with it. But we already have something huge, the, the, you know, bringing together the African continent, the Africa um, continental, continental free, free trade, trade area. India. Uh, and that alone, mm -hmm. if we're talking about business, is such a huge thing. From mm -hmm. Cape Town to Cairo, you know, it came into force a few years back. Uh, most of African countries have ratified the Africa Free Continental Trade Area. That would be a good vehicle for us to do our business and expand our economy, Jen. Um, you know, um, Uganda doesn't lack markets. Uh, whether it's uh, the ESC, expanded ESC to DRC, whether it's the tripartite, SADAC, COMESA, ESC, whether the continental free trade area, whether GOA, whether the European Union, who told us bring everything but arms, the markets are there. And for me, I believe that CFTA, the continental free trade area, or even the expanded East African community, is a market like any other market. But the issue for Uganda is what products, whether services or goods, are we putting in those markets? And that's, for me, an issue which we need really to seriously consider, that we put in a lot of money uh, to, for example, you were saying, build roads in DRC, mm? um, pacify South Sudan, but what are those products? have we developed which we can be able to sell and for me i think the first place to 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 start from is in uganda here you know be able to say what are those services which we as uganda can put on the market which are competitive you know I take an example of kenya kenya every time we we, we expand kcb is there you know, if it is now there, Safaricom is there. So what, what are those Ugandan products mm, which we can be able to develop and they become competitive? Because, you know, Patrick, trade is about a market, mm, a specific market and a specific product. And that product has to be specific in terms of quality, in terms of quantity that we have the CFTA or we have now DRC. What product are we sending there? Is it maize? Okay. Hmm? So in what quantity, uh, so our in legislators, what quality? Our legislators, uh, people like the Honorable Jojo Dong should be able to answer that because actually Jen has brought a very good issue. It appears our brothers in the East, the Republic of Kenya, have understood the game because we sent our men and women into South Sudan for peace protection and you know and <coughs> they went and stabilized south sudan they died for south sudan there you know we sent our men and women and are still there in somalia to stabilize somalia they are there they have died ugandan blood has been shed in somalia and so is in congo but when we come out the kenyans are able to make money in south sudan to make money in, in somalia they'll be able to make money in congo like they have made money elsewhere why? Look at our businesses. We do not have a huge business entity that is operating in the region. The Kenyans are here. They are making money in Equity Bank. They are making money in KCB. They are making money into in insurance. They are making money into, until recently into um, supermarkets. They are making money even right here. Uh, hello? I even right here where we are. <laughs> I didn't want to say so, that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we shouldn't begrudge Kenyans. For making money. No, I we mean, are not begrudging no, them. We want not. to learn. We can't learn. learn. Why can't we learn exactly. from them? Exactly. We learn. So you know, Let us learn. Absolutely. Mm. I agree with you mm. that you see, once we put our boots on the ground to pacify, for example, we are pass we pacified um, South Sudan and then of course <coughs> went back to 
to, to a bad situation where it is right now, but still there are efforts towards pacifying South Sudan. Our idea is that we should create an environment that should enable our businesses to flourish, our small, whatever small they may be. I was expecting Jen to, to tell us here that when South Sudan was peaceful, it was one of our biggest Market. markets. One of our biggest markets. Don't, don't mind the fact that we were selling tomatoes, um, you know, oranges, potatoes, and so on and so forth, because the people who are doing that business are Ugandans. And they are coming from all over. They come from Masaka, they come from Apache, they come from Lira, and so on and so forth. It's a good thing for our country. You know, the market should not only be, you know, it's an elitist view to think that market should only be for highly finished products. We can't be very competitive when it comes to high, high, high end <coughs> products, but we can still, our com uh, competitive advantage is in food, uh, yeah. and which, which, which we are producing. I, so the idea should be that can we scale up? Can we then mm -hmm. change our strategy so that even as we sell potatoes, even as we sell, you know, granites, even as we sell uh, goats, we, st we can also go into uh, value addition and scale up. But while the so market, so while I, the market I agree, exists, so I, I think what we should be doing is let us look internally. Are we having conversations about what strategy as a country we have to make sure that we take advantage of our ESC integration? That doesn't, that doesn't in any way discount the fact that regional integration is an important part of our growth strategy. I want to believe that our competitive advantage, real and comparative advantage, is in the area of agriculture. Because until Congo was, before Congo was admitted into the East African community, half of East Africa's arable land was here in Uganda. Maybe now 70% of that land is going to be in the Congo. But if we're having an understood that that is where our strength is, there hasn't been a deliberate effort to invest in the area of agriculture and agro-processing so that we deal with what God has given us and take it to a level where nobody can even dare to compete. That's why I was thinking that I wish, I wish in this conversation we're having, we had some people from uh, um, Minister of Finance, other people from the Minister of Planning and so on you and so forth. You are the policy makers, you tell them. Yeah, we, we provide the mm. policy framework. But mm. you see, in terms of national strategy, that is not our work as regional legislators. That comes down to the front line, you know, officers who are working in our different ministries. They're thinking about how we can advance our national interests vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our regional integration. Is the work of our policy makers at the, at the different ministries aligned to the regional agenda? Is the work of our, um, you know, strategic thinkers in the different sectors of our, our of, 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 of our government so we need we need really to to have that conversation i think that's where the missing link is for us to come together and focus and say okay now if we are put our boots in the democratic republic of congo we are pass we are building roads you know we are uh, we are setting up infrastructure in the democratic republic of congo so what so we need to ask the question so what now that's not a question that should come from arusha that's the question that should come from sure. our partner mm. states here. Mm. The thinking should be here <coughs> that what, uh, how do we leverage on the infrastructure, on the investment uh, of infrastructure in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo? We have the longest uh, borderline between Uganda and, 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 and Congo, right mm. from Arua up to mm. Bundibujo. No, up know? to Kisoro. Up to Kisoro. Yeah. Uh, up to Mount, see, from yes. Vura to Virunga. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing as a country to take advantage of that? You will not expect that that is going to come from, from Arusha. Arusha is going to give you the broader um, framework. It's going to give you this, you know, uh, superstructure, call it so. The rest of the, of the groundwork is for, for the country to think through it and come out with strategies aligned to that regional agenda. But you know, Jen, there are still some mm. kind of mutual suspicions among these partner states. Uh, some years back, there was a research conducted asking the people on uh, the whole idea of the East African integration. <coughs> and, and I'm told the people of Tanzania were so suspicious about their land that the Kenyans and Ugandans 
are likely to grab their land. Probably have heard about it. But also, there was something as, as funny as the Kenyan women, so scared that you open up the borders, the Ugandan women will steal our men. It may look funny, but it was captured in the research. Anyway, that mutual suspicion, how do you deal with it? Okay. Uh, before I go to the mutual suspicion, I, I think the previous conversation uh, is very critical around what exactly we should do as a country to position ourselves. Uh, and I think, uh, Honorable George, that conversation sh should start everywhere, mm. especially for you people mm. who are at that higher uh, policy level. Mm. Because we need to have some products we put on, on the market. Um, and I think we need also to, to be able to remember, for example, we are so good at education, you know? Where did it go, you know? In the region, the entire region, you know, education, right from university, secondary school, you know, we are good there. So, so the issue of products and services, where we can be able to, uh, to, to, to grow our competitiveness is really critical. Because if we don't do that, you know, even these negotiations for the CFTA won't bear any fruit. Because you see, negotiations, those trade negotiations, about market access. Like somebody you knock and you say, enter, but the door is locked. You have to go and open that door. That's market entry. We need a product or products which we put on the market and sustain our presence in those markets. For me, it's really, really important. Or else, we are going to remain with a selling of tomatoes, you know, with some pineapples, which is okay. And Honorable Georgia, I'm not saying, mm. because that's our uh, competitive and comparative advantage. But we need to, to, to scale up to, you know, a bit higher. Like you are saying, Patrick, let us add value, you know. Let us, man, you know, process. Let us package. The other time, I was uh, going to Dar es Salaam on Uganda Airlines. In fact, I took pictures. And they were serving Jews from Kenya, you know. And our Teju is there. In, on, in Uganda Uganda Airlines, on a Uganda Airlines flight. I have flight. it here. I have it here. You know, we need to raise the bar, you know. We can't stay saying we are good at agriculture. You know, DRC needs maize, but DRC imports maize from Argentina. So how do we position ourselves to make sure that we can be able to tell DRC that, no, stop importing maize from uh, Argentina. We have the quality, we have the quantity throughout the year when we are depending on, on the weather, when UNBS has been given just little money, you know? So, so we need to put our house in order. Mm. Or else this business of uh, DRC uh, going to the CFTA, we are just like escorting other people. So, so George, which, yes, uh, which, which also brings me, reminds me, if our business people are able to compete mm. at a global scale, then the cost of doing business in this region must be lowered. Because you may be find that the good, uh, goods that have come from Argentina, from Thailand, from China, are maybe cheaper. three, four times cheaper than what <coughs> Uganda is going to take next door. Why? Because our electric tariffs are high, you're going to produce at a high level. The cost of money, you know, borrowing, you know, it's expensive to borrow money they here. Those guys are getting money at a cheaper exactly. interest. Yeah. How, I mean, even uh, 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 and Patrick, mm -hmm. and that's the challenge we are going to face uh, because we are negotiating, for example, continental free trade area. When I hear people say, oh, there are opportunities out to there, there are also people pointing at Uganda. Oh, there, there is a market there. So we end up beca becoming a market for the other net importer exactly so how do we avoid that how do we lower the cost of doing business and if you lower that then our produce will be able to compete 
in the region or even at the continental level? You know, um, the ESC envisages the pooling together of resources that, um, you know, the different partner states should pool together. In fact, there was even um, <coughs> an attempt to come up with a protocol on ESC development fund to allow for, you know, um, companies, business people to borrow money at a much lower cost. These are the kinds of initiatives that we should be thinking about. But also, um, you see, we sign different protocols as, as, as ESC. The protocols are supposed to enable cooperation between the different partner states to look at what is it that um, the different partner states can invest collectively to reduce on the cost of doing business between the different uh, partner states. Now, what, what Jen was talking about here is that we need that in-house conversation. You're asking me what should we do? I think we need that in-house conversation. That is very specific, sector specific. If it is on infrastructure, what kind of investment in infrastructure do we need to facilitate trade? If it is on um, a discussion around interest rates, capping interest rates, that conversation should take place. That's why we are moving into a monetary uh, union. Although it is taking much longer period, but it's a kind of conversation that, that, that the different partner states should engage in so that you know you have common interest rates. A person should in, 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 in Kenya should borrow at the same rate as a Ugandan so that you know you are all competitive. The reason why we, we, we were having issues with, uh, with um, uh, different with interest rates. With, with, with actually the European Union, when we were negotiating the Economic the partnership, economic partnership agreement was because we said, you know, the, the, the farmers in, in, in Europe are subsidized. The, the, the cost of, um, of production mm. in Europe is much lower. Mm. So their products, are, they're just going to dump into the mm. East African community mm. region. But why don't we have a conversation here within the region in order to facilitate farmers? So that, you know, you are, if you're talking about maize, for example, then we sh you should zone out the region and say, you know, maize is much cheaper to be produced in, in Uganda than us having a tug of war between Uganda and now Kenya and so on. And so on. But those are conversations that should take place between the different You know, the when the East African government. community was revived, there were three st four stages this community should have what the, so, so was supposed to take. In fact, by 2012, all the stages were supposed to have been concluded, from the customs union Come to the common the market, market to the monetary yeah, union yeah, yeah. and the political federation. Yes. Oh, now, we have gotten the two, the yes. customs union and the common market. Yes. There's no monetary union and there's no political federation. Mm -hmm. And yet we are almost nine years uh, off target, despite of the fact that we had uh, um, something called the uh, fast tracking, you know, East African fast tracking entities. I don't know what they fast track. You know, Patrick. <laughs> There is what we call the principle of consensus, and I mentioned it initially. The principle of consensus, I think that has been the elephant in the room. Uh, consensus under the ESC, uh, it has even been taken for interpretation, uh, the ES East African uh, court. What is the meaning of consensus? And the court threw it back and said it's a political decision. And for ESC, consensus means all the six partner states must agree. Now, because of that, most of the decisions take a lot of time to arrive, you know, for member states to decide. Now, it has taken a longer period. But I'll tell you that it is better to take a long period mm. and all of you are on board than to try and say, let four people go and leave two behind. That can only be done under political confederation. That's why now we are going into But you know, we are, we are, you, remember, you, you remember, as long as we are you, still you remember operating under this treaty, consensus is a safety valve. You remember the slow, coalition of the willing? Sure. You remember the coalition of the willing? Yes. Yes, I remember the coalition of the willing. Because there is an exception close, but it also had, the, it almost destabilized. You know, it almost destabilized. The, the, the community and, 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 uh, and that's why um, there has been emphasis 
on that principle of consensus so that whatever strategic decision that the community is taking, it should be that all the six partner states are agreeable to it. It's a very slow one, it is very painful, but it's worth it. It's worth it if you okay. look at it. Jen, mm. if we look at, uh, for example, in the tourism sector, where probably we could also compete in hospitality industry and all that, Kenya has gone so far that if you visited any three-star hotel or five-star hotel, okay, there are not many five-star hotel in Uganda. By the way, Ugandans do not own any five-star hotel, unfortunately, including here at the Serena where we are. If you went is in three star or four star wherever they are whether it is in fort porto my home city or whether it is in imbarara or somewhere the top management of those hotels are going to be kenyans the top chefs are going to be kenyans <coughs> and i have nothing against them but i find it hard that we i find it funny and sad that ugandans are not learning in the area in the 60s and 70s uganda was taking top management uh, management of the kenyan hotels was in the hands of ugandans how we ceded that power, no one knows. But I think that's a, a decision uh, which uh, Ugandans have taken. It's a, a decision, really. Um, you go to Tanzania, you can't find that happening. In fact, Tanzania, they are so strict when it comes to work permits. I have a friend who had to leave uh, after you know after um, was it four years and they said bring evidence they told his organization he was working for for that organization to bring evidence whether there is no Tanzanian who can do that job you know so so it's uh, I, it's us as Ugandans and our skewed thinking that a certain uh, certain nationality can do a better job than us, which is really a pity. And it goes back to how we can be able to position ourselves. But is it, as really, a is it really the thinking yes. or also the reality? Because no, there has been no. a research that no, we no, do no, not that, no, no, don't say that Jen, research. Jen, don't say Jen, Jen, don't. I have heard. Don't I've say heard that research. That we do not only have an no. employment problem in Uganda, that even our graduates are unemployable. Th they are, but, but also other countries, Not my words, they, Jen. they are graduates and unemployable, you know. It isn't just common to Uganda alone. It's the nature of the education and what the markets are demanding, you know. We need to work on it, but don't say that, that you know, some, you know, what some countries, members, one, people, one person can do, in ten people. No, that's propaganda and I don't agree. Ugandans, our, our children are very brilliant and they can do good work, you know. So let us just put our house in order. And if we don't do that, our children are just going to go, continue going to Arab countries where they are going to work as, uh, uh, as maids, graduates as maids. So, so let us put our house in order. Let us organize our economy. Let us organize our trade, and let us also organize the policies around that. Honorable George, we are talking about the, the interest rates. You can talk about interest rates when we have privatized the entire banking sector. And the banks, they ignore the, the CBR. They just ignore it, you know? So, so there are things which you can't do. And you can't compare us to Kenya. Kenya has its KCB. And the Kenya government can be able to say where money should go. But here, which government, which bank can post bank? You know? So, so let us put our house in order. Our house is in disarray. All right. And that's yeah. why when we start trading, you know, we are talking about cross border trade somewhere here talking about taking maize. What we need to raise the bar. This country has a lot, a lot of potential. All right, Jen and George, hold on to your points because we're going to take a break and when we come back, I'll open the lines so that you too can be a part of this discussion. You're going to see the numbers on your screen. Pick your phone and tell us what you think about the DRC joining the East African community and the whole idea of the East African community integration process. We will be right back.
Welcome back. You're watching On The Sport. My name is Patrick Amara. My guests tonight are Jen Nalunga and Honorable Jojo Dong. And we're discussing the DRC joining the East African community and what would that mean for the people in this region that now stretches from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. And this is the moment when you get to have your say. You're going to see the numbers on the screen. Please pick your phone, call us and tell us what you think. Make it precise and concise so that you can get as many views as possible. As I wait for your calls, let me continue engaging the guests tonight. Um, you know, I know Honorable George, President Yoweri Museveni must be really happy on the NRM government because I have not seen any leader on the African continent who is so focused on the integration of Africa, the integration of the region, African Pan-Africanism. Pan now when you add Africa's second largest country <coughs> on, the, on the group, Considering it was the biggest proponent. Let me first take this. I have a call online. Hello. Hello. I have a call online. Looks like uh, we dropped that line. If you add Africa's second largest country on the block, considering that President Joe William Museveni was, has been at the far front of this drive, um, he must be a very happy man because this is just right within what he has always fought for. Of course, yes, he is happy because that has been uh, his dream. He has been talking about uh, Pan African. Hello. Yes, we have a call. We have a call online. Hello. Yes. Uh, thanks for the program. Your name, sir, and where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm calling from Gaza. Okay, you're on air, Jeffrey. Yes. Uh, I thank the president for for advocating for uh, more countries to join the East African community. Yes. Uh, the challenge we have is uh, that uh, the government lacks institutionalized support to our uh, traders or companies. You see most of the traders will deal in border border, mm -hmm. selling vegetables. Uh, countries in other East African countries like Kenya will support their, their, their banks will support uh, bigger companies to do trade. Mm -hmm. So that is the major disadvantage I see. All right. If uh, our government can actively support uh, our companies to set up better standards of our goods to favorably compete in the, in the market, uh, we get uh, cheap credits, we shall benefit from uh, DRC market. Short of that, we are just wasting our time. We shall just join border border, sell vegetables, uh, which have little impact on our economy, and, and also be middlemen because. When these companies come, we, we basically sell Chinese products we import from China. Okay. We actually sell uh, uh, products made in our country. Thank you so much, our caller there from Gayaza is talking about you know um, making it easy for the Ugandan business people, the Ugandan producers and the industrialists uh, to be able to make goods uh, that can compete. Uh, let me pick another caller. Hello. Hello. What's your name and where are you calling from? Yes, please. Yes, you are, what's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Ambrose Biamudisha. Yes, Ambrose. I'm calling from Katanga. You are on air. Ambrose, go right ahead. I am asking who is responsible for the rebels. I see M.T. in Congo. I see the suffering of South Sudanese. And I see Rwanda broke the border. Where was the South And how I going to solve that problem of rebels? Ambrose, thank you so much. It's a question I've tried to ask also at the very beginning, and Jojo was attempting uh, to answer it. I think now uh, uh, he has added more, uh, you know, intuition to it, so he's going to respond. Probably he has an idea as an honorable member, a legislator at the East African Parliament. Uh, please uh, tell us your name and where you're calling from, and then we make it short. You have another call online. Hello. Okay. We're talking about this um, pan-Africanism, uh, which I think is a good thing. When you read President Joweri Museveni's books, uh, way back from the time of school in in entire way back uh, at at, at, uh, at the university in Dar es Salaam, I have another caller online. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, Kamala. Yes. What's your name, sir, and where are you calling from? Yes, this is Kiwewa Haman, and I'm calling from Kibari, Kochilakai district. 
Okay, yeah, Haman, you are on air. Please go right ahead and tell us what you want to say tonight. Yes, it is okay for the RSC to join the East African community, and it has no problem. But my question is, Mr. George, before the RSC joins, then what, what is the... I hear that we are not in good terms with Uganda and Rwanda. Before we call upon the RSC to, to join us, why don't we first sort the controversies we have between Uganda and Rwanda? Mr. George, help me and answer that. Thank All right, thank you so much. I'll call her from Kibale. Uh, thank you so much. So, well, maybe maybe you could attempt to do, you have two questions already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on the question of Uganda um, and Rwanda, I think we you can see that um, we are making some very positive uh, progress in the line of normalizing our relations. Um, there is um, a bilateral um, <coughs> framework in place uh, that is fast tracking no the normalization of our relations with Rwanda and um, that is good for the community because um, anything that solves our problems is welcome is welcome like I said earlier on that the um, there are lessons for us to learn over the last 20 years um, and, and, and our treaty is not cast in stone that we should now begin to envisage uh, that uh, there can be disagreements between partner states and therefore we need to have the necessary resources in place to resolve those differences once they arise and it's even more critical now that we are adding other partner states so the the, the, the conversation going forward should be for us to get um, to be able to come out with um, the necessary tools and they should have the you know the force of, 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 of law so that we can be able to resolve uh, some of these emerging, emerging um, issues that can arise between the different uh, partner states. Um, okay, let's we could not let, wait. Let, let, let's, let us take this caller and then you can... We have a caller online. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? My name is, my name is Bukaba and I'm calling from Kamwenge. From Kamwenge? Somewhere in Europe. Somewhere in Europe. Okay. Go right ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, my, but I, 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 all I have to say about this is there is no rush. We are late. I heard the lady say that we should first wait. No. We, people started waiting in 1963. If we do not, we can learn on the job. As long as we move, as, uh, once we are now tied by these cities, then we, we can learn on the job, we can start imitating and, and correcting our mistakes along the way. Africa is late. You can see Europe, during the COVID time, Europe minded their own business. But if we had, if we had, uh, if we had integrated longer ago, we would have been able to also solve our own problems here. Okay. So, me, I, I've seen the results of, uh, of that road to Juba. In Gulu, that road to Juba changed the lives of the people of the North and South Sudan. And when there was a war, it, it closed down again. Then when there was peace, we saw the progress it made. So, with, the, with Congo, we, are, we have to be practical. There has been so much rhetoric of an Africanism, if we don't do practical things like this, we shall never move a step. Thank you so much, our caller there. He's saying that he's calling from somewhere in Europe. You know, uh, talking about Europe, I, I was trying to look through the international channels, and uh, East Africa joining, DRC joining the East African community, which in my view was such a big step, was not as highlighted as much as the M23 bringing down a UN helicopter in, 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 in close to Bunagana. Do you think... Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but do you think uh, people in Western uh, Europe I have a call online? Hello? Hello? All right. But does that surprise you really, Patrick? Uh, is it surprising that you can see that the, um, the Western media is concentrating on the bad news? It's not the first time that they are doing that. In any case, do you think they are happy? 
that the, the, the DRC has joined the East African community? I don't think so. Because you see, like, like Jen uh, earlier on said, that you know, DRC is a contested zone. There are so many interested parties, everyone tearing DRC apart. Mm -hmm. So when DRC mm -hmm. uh, begins to, you know, to, 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 to establish and, and build relations. And with say this is where we want to be. Say this is where we want to be. I don't think the other parties are, are, are happy with it. I, so I think, I think, I think the regional fight. leaders have to watch out for the, the parties interested in the DRC exactly. because exactly. this could just right get into yeah. their interest and uh, I think that's what our, our, our caller from Europe was saying mm. and, and I'm looking at probability of uh, um, the Horn of Africa Ethiopia which is uh, by I think population could be the second largest mm -hmm. country in Africa mm -hmm. over 100 million people mm -hmm. joining here and Somalia by the way the African Union mission in Somalia has now changed today not it's no longer I'm some it's now mm. uh, Artemis mm. Artemis Africa mm. transition mission in Somalia mm. so if Somalia and Ethiopia there has been indication that they also want to join the East African community if we did that we're almost going to the Red Sea go to the Indian Ocean and go to the Atlantic this could be the superpower of Africa why um, not okay um, I, I don't want to be a pessimist but I think it's important um, that just joining is not an end in itself, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, just because we say, you come, mm -hmm. you come, or you join, you join, you know. What are we using? You know, mm -hmm. I go back to what George raised about pulling resources, you know. We need to have a reason, an objective. You know, even Pan-Africanism, I, I remember when you read the Lagos Plan of Action, you know, which envisaged Africa as one, you know, one regional, regional grouping. It, it talked about structural transformation of our continent, that we put our resources internally for, for us as Africans, that we can be able to compete and negotiate with outsiders, you know, that we can be able to create jobs, to industrialize, you know. So, so uh, a superpower won't come automatically just because that country and that country is joining. Uh, and I think it's also important that we strengthen our institutions, you know, so that when we, that, that when we broaden, it, it will be easy to absorb those new countries when our institutions are really strong. Yala, very strong. You know, the East African Secretariat, very strong, yeah. addressing issues of dispute. B because you see, to go back to what George said, um, when the East African community started, you know, it, it's, uh, you can't talk about trade without disputes. Mm -hmm. Even when you are trading on the village, you know, the, the, the scale mm -hmm. can have a problem. Okay. So there has to be a way of resolving disputes. Mm -hmm. All right, our time, I want to thank you so much for your time uh, tonight, but most of all for your input and your insight. Our time is out, but again, let me ask you, uh, Jen, uh, to make your contributing, your co concluding remark. Uh, my concluding remarks is that there are opportunities in being together, uh, the opportunities in Pan-Africanism. But those opportunities don't come on a silver plate. We need to plan, you know. We need also to be aware that there are threats. So we need also to be aware and plan on how to be able to take advantage of the opportunities, but also address the threats. You're parting short? Um, I want first of all to congratulate the DRC for joining the ESC. Um, ESC is a work in progress. Um, the nuts and bolts of how we perfect our um, integration is, is something that we can continue to scale up as, as, um, as, as we continue to move as one uh, East African community. So I am, I am happy that they have come in. They have taken the bold decision to come in. But that also challenges now the, the ESC, you know, to, you know, to, 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 
to up their game uh, because the DRC coming into the picture is um, is a challenge to the to the to the region both in terms of infrastructure in terms of security <coughs> so all the protocols the protocols on infrastructure the protocols on security are, uh, have got to be looked at in detail to see that we can facilitate the entry of, of, of DRC into the East African community. But I also want to take this opportunity to, you know, to send my condolences to the family of the late Right Honorable Jacob Olanya, uh, to the Parliament of Uganda, and to the people of Uganda for the loss. Uh, Jacob Olanya was a very passionate uh, advocate of regional integration. And um, I remember the last, last uh, public appearance in, um, was at a conference um, that was organized by the Parliamentary Forum on East African Community Affairs where he spoke very, very passionately mm -hmm. on matters of regional integration. Mm -hmm. So I really want to take this opportunity to send my condolences to the family and uh, to the people of Uganda for the loss. I want to thank you so much for your time and uh, I think I'm also one of those who are happy to hear that the DRC is joining the East African community because let's face it, these borders were not for our own making. Somebody sat somewhere in Europe and decided to dissect the African continent and called us names and said we are, we are nations of, of different interests. But well, let's face it, if you look at the Ugandan border, you see, see the eastern, on the eastern flank, we have Sabine across in Kenya. You have the, the Topof and, and, and the Turkana, and they are the same as the Karamojong. You have the Itoset in Kenya across the border. There's a time when Kenya had a vice president, Moody Awori, mm. when his brother, mm. uh, Agro Awori, was <laughs> running for president mm. here in Uganda. Uganda. Mm. Could you imagine if Awori had won, there could have been an Awori president in Uganda and an Awori vice president in Kenya, and yet they belong to the same family. If you look into our southern flank, you'll see that uh, the Baha'i will speak the same language and all those people. When you go to Rwanda, people in Kisoro and people in Rwanda, it's, you are largely the same because the language is the same. But if you come up, uh, areas of Kasese, they are more Bakunjo, the DRC, than they are in, in Uganda. And if you come closer to where I come from, people who speak Runyakitara, there are more people speaking my language in Congo, they are called the Hema, in the areas of Bunia, than they are in Uganda. If you continue up to areas of Vura, you'll find that there are more Azu <coughs> in the DRC than they are in the Arua area. And if you go to northern Uganda, you'll find also there are so many people, actually, who are speaking uh, the Luo people in South Sudan than they are actually here in Uganda. Can you imagine? We are the same. We had been integrated even earlier, only that we have been blindfolded by these imaginary boundaries. Good night and God bless Uganda.